What's up guys, DEO Productions here back with another video. This time is the MacBook Pro 15 inch review. I promised it to you when I did the unboxing. Of course, if you didn't watch any of the other videos that I've put up lately, go ahead and uh, check them out here. I'll put a link up there in the corner that you could check some of those out. Um, I have been getting some good feedback from you. Uh, make sure to smash that like button down there and subscribe to the channel. Everyone knows Apple makes some of the best tech on the market. The Apple Watch is arguably the best smartwatch out there. The iPhone X can arguably be said that it is one of the best smartphones of the year. When it comes to computers, it's no different. The MacBook Pro and iMac lineup are two of the best laptops and desktops respectively. So it is no surprise that I, as a YouTube creator and content maker, would choose the MacBook Pro. And that's exactly what we're gonna review today, the MacBook Pro 15 inch model. So let's start off by saying it is an awesome machine, but it is not the cheapest machine. If you are looking for something that is not that high in price, Apple's probably not gonna be somewhere you look. So what do you get for that money? And why do so many content creators seem to choose Apple and Mac OS over Windows? All that's coming up in the MacBook Pro 15 inch review. market is absolutely immersive. There are so many different options out there uh, from ultrabooks to two-in-ones to convertibles uh, to standalone to gaming PCs and laptop. But when it comes to Apple, there's really only a couple choices. There is your iMac, which is the bigger desktop version. There is the MacBook, which is a smaller version. There is the MacBook Air, which is supposed to be lighter and the lightest version on the lineup for Matt Apple. And then there's the MacBook Pro, which is supposed to be professionals, content creation, and anybody who needs a little bit more power. This right here, what I have is the 15 inch MacBook Pro. It is one of the top end models of the MacBook Pro line. With top end comes top end price. We are talking $27.99 here. Now I did get a deal at Best Buy. They do come up every once in a while. And I was able to snag $250 off. So why would I spend $2,700 on a machine? What possibly could possess me to purchase this particular machine versus the four or five other configurations of MacBook Pros? And why Apple over Windows? I'm gonna get to all of that plus all the specs and tech talk about this particular machine here in just a second. So as I like to do with my reviews, I like to start off with the outside of it. I wanna show you everything on the actual machine so you get an idea of what you are getting into and the build quality and how I feel and my impressions of the actual machine itself. Then I'll go ahead and rattle off some specs. We'll go why we would choose Apple over Windows and why content creation should probably be done more on a Mac. So on the outside of the actual machine itself, you get a, a two-piece unibody design that features a nice space gray aluminum. You get the Apple logo here, which is a reflective, almost mirror-like finish. Of course, this is not the light-up version that is featured on the MacBook Air and the MacBooks of the past, although I do like this design. The color options for the MacBook Pro are space gray and silver. This model is the space gray. It's just a little bit darker, a little bit sleeker um, than the silver. The silver is a little bit lighter, of course, but both offer the same functionality. Color obviously has nothing to do with any of the internal changes. Now the laptop itself is 4.02 pounds. It's pretty light, it's pretty sleek. It's not as light or sleek as the 13 inch, but it certainly does beat the competition of the Surface Book 2 and the Dell XPS 15. Uh, coming around to the right side, you have two Thunderbolt 3 ports USB-C. You have the three and a half millimeter headphone jack. On the left side, you have two Thunderbolt 3 ports USB-C again. On the front, you have the lid to actually lift it off, which is a very nice design. Um, doesn't require a lot of force or monkeying around. You just one finger uh, design here. On the back, you have four rubber feet with six hex screws to hold on the back panel. You, uh, you have the exhaust vents to each side and the exhaust vent on the back as well. On the inside of the computer, you have the 15.4 inch LED display. You have the keyboard, the absolutely massive trackpad, uh, speakers flanking each side of the keyboard and the palm rests on each side. As far as bezels around the screen, you have a decent forehead here which houses a 720p FaceTime camera. You've got the MacBook Pro logo there on the bottom and a little tiny maybe half inch uh, border around the outside. Um, so as far as chin and bezels, you know, it, it's not bezel-less. 
uh, and it's probably not as good as the Dell XPS Infinity Edge display, uh, but it does serve its purpose. I, I would probably say that you're probably going to start seeing maybe even that notch and a borderless uh, edgeless display here in the future. Uh, so when it comes to the keyboard, uh, you have the standard QWERTY layout here. You've got the glass OLED display here for the Touch ID and Touch Bar. The Touch ID also functions as the power button. You have the second generation butterfly switches in the keyboard. We'll get to that in just a little bit. Now when it comes to the trackpad, it is an absolutely massive trackpad. Probably two times or three times as big as most other laptops on the market. And is a glass trackpad with force touch technology. So the first impressions were really actually pretty good. I absolutely like the weight. I do like the lap ability. It is something that you can have in your lap for a longer period of time. Uh, now, in terms of being able to get a little hot, it does get a little hot, especially when you're doing encoding and rendering and final cut. And the bulk of the heat is right here on the back. That's where most of the components are housed. So it does get a little hot right there. And if the fan is going, you are gonna notice uh, a little bit of uh, heat being exhausted out of here. It is very very thin a lot thinner than what you would think out of a very powerhouse laptop like this I enjoy it. The screen is 500 nits. We'll get to that in just a minute. It is pretty bright It is the brightest display that I've seen on The laptops that I've compared of course I've used the surface book 2. I've used the Dell XPS 15 That's my daily driver at work and I've used this and this is one of the brighter displays out there You do get a reflective screen and it's not a dull screen like is found on the non 4k version of the Dell XPS 15 um, it, but if you are touching it at any point it is going to be a lot more fingerprinty of course this is not a touchscreen model there are no touch screens uh, with the iMac or the MacBook Pro or MacBook or MacBook Air lineup um, so if you ever are touching the screen for whatever need you know just moving it in and out you are going to notice fingerprints much more clearly uh, than the dull versions of screens. Now I'm not sure as if there's an oleophobic uh, coating on the actual keyboard itself, but it is pretty nice. It does resist smudges um, a little bit. Uh, over time, of course, the use is going to definitely show up here. I've used some of these keys a little bit, and you do have to have it just in the right lighting to see uh, the smudges and stuff like that, but it's pretty thin, it's pretty flat, and it's going to be something you could just wipe off pretty easily. Now, the trackpad does not have as much trouble as the keyboard and screen do it does not get many fingerprints almost at all although we will talk about the massive trackpad itself in just a moment to the left and right i notice a few smudges here and there so it is not the most fingerprint resistant uh, aluminum but it is pretty nice the speakers to either side are a fair size about the same size as the actual width of the keyboard or the height of the keyboard rather um, do not, you, you really don't even see them. They blend in real nice with the design. In terms of portability, this is gonna be a little bit on the heavier side. There is something you can get a little bit uh, lighter, but it is gonna be something that you can put in a laptop bag or a backpack and, and carry relatively easily. Uh, but do, do remember you are gonna to have to have uh, the dongles, especially because this is USB-C. There is no full USB uh, type 3.0. Uh, there is no SD card slots. Uh, Ethernet ports, anything like that. When you actually go to Apple's website and you click on the 15 inch tab to get the MacBook Pro, you have two different base prices. You have $23.99 and $27.99. Of course, those are customizable. Uh, you can get different hard drive sizes, different processor. So this is the $27.99 model, and I'm gonna go ahead and rattle off the specs now. You get a 15.4 inch diagonal LED backlit display with IPS technology. That has a native resolution of 2880 by 1800. 220 pixels per inch. Uh, this model comes with the faster 2.9 gigahertz quad-core Intel Core i7 with turbo boost up to 3.9 gigahertz with 8 megs of L3 cache. Now these models are configurable as I said and this is one of the configurable pieces. Uh, it is configurable to 3.1 gigahertz quad-core Intel Core i7 with turbo boost up to 4.1 gigahertz and 8 megs of shared cache. Uh, 512 gig PCIe NVMe onboard SSD configurable up to one tier or two tier SSD. You get 16 gigs of 23, 2133 megahertz LPDDR3 RAM. You get a Radon Pro 560 with four gigs of GDDR5 memory and automatic graphics switching. The other graphics you have are the Intel HD graphics 630. You get those four Thunderbolt 3 USB-C ports. 
each of those can be used as a charging or display port. You get the touch bar with integrated touch ID sensor, which also functions as the power button. You get a 64 or 65 key layout, including four arrow keys. You get that massive force touch trackpad with precise cursor for, for pressure sensitive capabilities. It enables force clicks, accelerometers, pressure sensitive drawing, and multi-touch gestures. You are getting 802.11 AC Wi-Fi wireless networking. Uh, that is backwards compatible with ABG and N. You are getting Bluetooth 4.2 wireless technology, a 720p FaceTime HD camera. This does support up to two displays of 5K 5120 by 2880 resolution at 60 hertz, up to four displays with a 4096 by 2304 resolution, and up to four displays with a 3840 by 2160 4K resolution. It gets native display port over USB-C and the adapters for VGA, HDMI, and Thunderbolt 2 are sold separate. You're getting stereo speakers with high dynamic range, three microphones, and that three and a half millimeter headphone jack. Now it does tow it up to 10 hours of wireless web, 10 hours of iTunes movie playback, 30 days of standby time, and a built-in 76 watt hour lithium polymer battery comes with an 87 watt USB-C power adapter. Now if anybody is worried about MacBook Pro and the environment, you're getting a mercury free LED backlit display, arsenic free display glass, BFR and PVC and beryllium free, highly recyclable aluminum enclosure, meets the Energy Star 6.1 requirements and is rated at EP Gold. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about some of those specs because I kind of read them off fast and I want everybody to understand what they are getting for the price that they are paying. Now this is the 2799 model and as I spoke, you are getting the 2.9 gigahertz quad core Intel Core i7. Now this is a quad core. This is four individual cores on the actual chip. Uh, if you opt for a 13 inch MacBook Pro, uh, both the i5 and the i7 versions are only dual core. Um, so you only get two cores as opposed to four. And what is the difference? You have to think about it as a two lane versus a four lane highway. If you have a huge traffic jam, more cars are going to be able to flow through four than two, and that's the same reference to data that you can make. Base on this model is a 2.9 gigahertz quad core i7 with eight megs of L3 cache. That is exactly the same on all versions of the um, chipsets that you can get. So that eight meg is going to be standard throughout all of them. Now, when it comes to clock speed, you are going to be getting a 2.9 base and a 3.9 turbo or if you want to configure it up, it's a 3.1 gig and a 4.1 turbo. The only time you're really going to need clock speed if you're going to be using CPU intensive tasks. So definitely think about that getting that faster CPU if you're a hardcore 4K or 8K video rendering person or you do any kind of CAD work or anything like that. I think 4.1 gigahertz is pretty awesome for a laptop. Uh, we're in the age where you're definitely getting this very powerful four and a half, almost five gigahertz turbo clocks on these, but uh, for a laptop, 4.1 gigahertz with a quad core is pretty, pretty nice. Of course, the more power you put in this machine, the hotter it gets. So now when it comes to the data storage, you're getting that 512 gig at PCIe NVMe SSD. That is the latest, that is the fastest standard that you can get with SSD, and it's going to be a lot faster than spinners that you're going to get in traditional desktops. You really have to think of the SSD as where the data stores and how fast uh, can it be accessed. So with spinners you have literal metal platters that are in there uh, that get read by a read head and it can take some time to go find that and go back to the brain of the hard drive and say where is that data and go find it. It all happens within milliseconds uh, but when it comes to SSD it's instantaneous, it's flash. Uh, it's very, very quick and much faster than spinners. Now, when it comes to the laptop, you are getting 16 gigs of LP DDR3, and basically what that means is low power DDR3. Uh, so the new standard out there is DDR4. It is a bit faster. It has higher clock speeds, but of course it has a higher price as well as a higher temperature. Uh, low power, now basically being able to cram all of the technology that they do in these laptops requires that uh, you don't use a lot of power because you're not able to power all that. It's almost impossible. You have to have an external power supply to be able to power that. And not only that, being able to lap this when it's that hot because it's running all the time or running those very, very high intensive uh, components, it's not something that is very feasible in a laptop. 
but do not believe that low power means it is not capable. These 16 gigs of 2133 megahertz it is a very nice base clock, and even though it is low power DDR3 and not DDR4, it definitely is going to offer a lot of performance for what you're going to get. So let's talk about that VRAM for a second, that GDDR5, that 4 gigs of Radeon. You're not getting CUDA cores here. This is not NVIDIA. This is Radeon, and really, the whole discussion between Radeon and NVIDIA is a whole other video. Uh, but you're getting 4 gigs of VRAM here, that GDDR5 memory, and it's Radeon Pro. Uh, now, there are other options out there. The NVIDIA GTX 1050 and 1060, which is offered in the Surface Book 2, as well as the Dell XPS 15, are going to be better options out there and support those CUDA cores. Um, but this is very, very good. Do not get this wrong. And of course, the way Apple makes the connection between the software and the hardware, as we know, is second to none. So being able to utilize whatever graphics is on there, whether the internal Intel HD graphics or the standalone graphics card, it's going to be done seamlessly and much better than the competition. So in terms of what I was actually seeing out of the battery life is another thing I wanted to discuss. It says 10, times, 10 hours of web browsing and 10 hours of this or that. I was actually seeing about 6 or 7 um, doing a lot of video editing in Final Cut. Uh, but I was seeing close to that 10 mark when I was just using uh, YouTube, playing around on the internet and stuff like that, using very, very light gaming. Uh, when it comes to gaming, you're probably not going to be doing a lot of it here. Uh, this is not an Alienware. It is not an HP Omen. It's not something that's going to have that 6 or 8 gigs of VRAM and that very, very powerful screen and processor and something that is more dedicated to gaming. But you are going to get something that is going to be able to handle um, high settings at about 60 frames per second. You're going to get more frames per second when you go down to the medium. So this is probably not the best for gaming, but it definitely uh, can be done on this machine. Now being able to offer 802.11ac, which is the latest wireless standard, it is nice. Uh, having that backwards compatibility with A, B, G, and N is awesome as well. And it's 2018 now, and we're starting to expect these things out of these. And some of those Intel chips and stuff like that uh, work very well, and this is no different. Now, what you're getting for output, of course, is these four USB-C Thunderbolt ports. Uh, so if you did want full USB 3.0 or, or USB Type-A, or if you did want an SD card slot, again, this is not the machine for you, both the Dell XPS 15 as well as the Surface Book 2, which is uh, why I keep referencing those really is, is where this space is. This is a lighter, uh, more powerful model that is really ba based for content creation and those power users, but not something that's gaming and not something that's just for the casual user. So getting back to that, the uh, output for both of those is a lot better. Now the dongles uh, can get kind of expensive, expensive, but as we see the slimmer machines and the portability get to get a little bit better and better, uh, you're really going to start seeing these kind of ports on them and it really is the latest and greatest when it comes to, comes to tech. So let's go ahead and open up the machine now and take a look at some of the internal components. So when it comes to uh, the keyboard, that's a whole other story. The touch bar and touch ID is a whole other story. Trackpad's a whole other story, and the screen's a whole other story. So we'll go ahead and start with the keyboard. Uh, a lot of people don't like it. It uses Apple's second generation butterfly mechanism. Very, very shallow, bottoms out rather easily, and is rather tactile, rather clicky, kind of loud. Um, and it's not something I personally uh, have too much of a problem with. Uh, it's going to be something that if you type a lot or maybe blog a lot or create a lot of papers and stuff like that with or maybe you sit in the library studying all day, not going to be something that you're going to really enjoy all that much because it is really kind of loud and it's much on the louder side and it definitely doesn't offer a lot of key travel. Now again, I have no problem with it. I don't type as much as uh, other users might, but Again, this is something that uh, to each his own and something that maybe you should definitely take into consideration if you were thinking about buying this and what setting you're going to be in. So here's a short video clip of me typing uh, to do a little better understanding of this keyboard and what you're getting with it. So I've gone ahead and offer, uh, opened up a notepad here just so you can understand uh, just how loud and tactile the keys are, just how clicky they can be. Um, and this is a very silent area I'm in, so uh, I just want you guys to hear this. So the next 
really comes with that giant, and I mean giant, trackpad. Most trackpads on laptops are about a third of the size of this, uh, but Apple really decided that they're going to ramp up on the size of it. It is one of the biggest, it probably is the biggest, let's just go ahead and put it out there. It is the biggest trackpad out there, and if you have big hands and you have big fingers, uh, you know, there is a pretty good amount of palm space there, but I do find myself ever so slightly kind of brushing over if I go to move, especially from one side of the keyboard to another. It's a very sensitive trackpad, uh, but it does have that multi-gesture support, and it has a force touch. It also has glass. It is not very fingerprinty. It is going to resist those very nicely, and the click is something that is actually uh, pretty nice, and it's something that you kind of have to get used to. You can set it up with a Windows with the left and right click, uh, and the force touch is actually nice. So the speakers on this, as we talked about before, are really, really nice. Uh, they flank the keyboard, and they are pretty uh, invisible when it comes to the actual um, look and aesthetics of the laptop. It's really hard to actually see them from just sitting on a surface. But of course, if you, you stand it up or you put it in the right angle, you're definitely going to see the little holes there on either side, and that's just an indicative of a typical keyboard. Uh, most keyboards these days opt for something that is bottom firing or front facing. These are a nice stereo speaker sound. It's one of the best speakers I've ever heard on the laptop. So I've included a sound clip here for you to hear just how good they really are. So I've gone ahead and opened up a video here on YouTube just to show you uh, the speakers. Now these speakers are stereo speakers. They're really, really, really nice. They are on the top of the keyboard. They are not side or bottom firing. They are not front facing, and they're not anywhere embedded in the screen like as is the Surface Book 2 but it offers a very, very loud and immersive uh, sound. Uh, it doesn't have as much punch as a lot of speakers do in terms of bass, but the mids are good, the highs are good, they don't get distorted, and it's a very loud experience. Hasn't stepped away just for a little bit and gone back to where I normally film just to give you an idea of the sound quality and the loudness. You do get a pretty nice bass note here. Um, this is the highest it goes. So let's go ahead and move up to the touch bar. Now, basically, what the touch bar is. It is an OLED glass strip that sits up here just above the keyboard where the typical function keys would be, and it replaces your function keys. It also allows for, based on whatever application you're in, to kind of dynamically change uh, to better suit you in that application. So being in Safari and trying to bring up a web page real quick, you can just literally click on whatever web page you want, and I'm sure you can probably configure it. Um, but when you're just on the regular desktop, uh, you can see here it wants me to unlock with Touch ID. It also has options for screen brightness, keyboard brightness, and volume. Over here to the far right, you're going to have that Touch ID sensor, which also functions as a power button. Now, Touch ID is one of the safest, fastest, and best biometric readers out there. It definitely beats having to swipe down uh, over and over again to try to pick up your key or your fingerprint and it definitely is going to be all the other competition out there, hands down, I believe, when it comes to laptops. If you've ever used Touch ID on the iPhone or iPad, this is exactly the same way. Uh, it is exactly the same setup, and that's one of the things that I'll get to about the ecosystem and how everything just seems to be the same on, on everything, um, and one of the reasons why you might want to go with Mac. So I'm going ahead and, and included uh, a short clip here of uh, going into Safari, showing what options are available, um, and what it does when it's just sitting on the desktop or to other applications. So guys, here is the touch bar with Touch ID. As you can see here, I'm just on the regular uh, desktop, uh, nothing really open. And as you can see here on the far right, you have the Siri button, and this is all just touch, so all I gotta do is just touch the Siri button, and it, bring, it brings up Siri here. Uh, now if you wanna turn down the volume, you have volume controls here, and you've got the brightness here. So all I've got to do is just hit this little carrot key, and it brings up the rest of the functionality of the touch bar, which literally replaces all the function keys that you would normally have on a standard laptop. So as you can see here, the brightness of the screen. Tapping brings the brightness. Um, 
Right here, you bring up your finder, which brings up all your apps. As you can see here, this is the brightness for the keyboard, up and down. And here is your place and fast forward and skip tracks for those and your volume there as well. So I've opened up a fresh web page here and I want you to see just how the touch bar changes and how it changes per app. So as you can see here, uh, just a blank web page. Uh, maybe if you wanted Bing or Google or Apple or what I use a lot is League Secretary from Bowling. Or let's say uh, you don't want any of those and you want to swipe. Uh, you can just keep swiping through. It's actually pretty intuitive, really nice. And we'll go ahead and just go to the Apple website here. And it loads the Apple page. So being able to have the touch bar change to whatever app you're using is awful nice. And of course here you can just open up another tab. And if you wanted uh, the functionality that you had in the desktop, all you gotta do is come here, hit this, and you get that as well. It slides back in. And you just hit the X here to close that out and bring it back to whatever app that currently is front facing and running. You can also hit the search button here uh, and it will basically offer, ask you to type in what you want and then you get to use the keyboard to type. So I've gone home ahead and opened up a page here, a picture, actually. And as you can see, I can rotate it. I can change the orientation. And I can flip the orientation as well. That's really all you get uh, when you open up this particular application, which is Preview. Now, let's go ahead and go to the screen. Uh, the screen is actually really nice. It's 500 nits. Uh, it's one of the brighter displays out there. I think it definitely beats out the Surface Book 2 and Dell XPS 15. It may not be as sharp, but it is that retina display um, with that 1880, uh, 2550 by 1880 uh, native resolution. But it may not be as sharp as that, and but it is going to offer a very nice uh, color accuracy when it comes to Adobe RGB. Um, it's going to have that wide color gamut, P3 color gamut, and it's going to be best suited for content creators um, and video makers. All right guys, so let's go ahead and go over some of the benchmarks that we were getting with this machine. Now benchmarks are really just an idea of what kind of performance you're gonna get out of your machine. So this is the Geekbench. Uh, you're getting a single core score of 4622 there with a multi-core score of 15,948. Of course, the specs are right there below. That is really, really good. Uh, but it, when it comes to overall comparison, uh, where it sits between all the other Apple products, it's not the top. I mean, and really you can't expect it to be for what it is. Uh, the late 2017 iMac Pro, that three or that four or $5,000 machine has a score nearly triple that. But again, when you look at that machine, you have to look at what it's using. It's using a server grade Intel Core uh, W2107B, 2.5 gigahertz, 14 cores. It's literally double uh, what this is. You're also going to be getting a lot more RAM and a lot more uh, graphics processing power in that machine. Uh, most of these that actually do beat it out have Xeon processors. So really, when you talk about Xeon, you think about what you pay for Xeons, which are several thousand dollars uh, for a processor chip. You have to look at it and go, wow, you know, this is an Intel Core i7 that actually competes and beats most of the other i7s, but also is up there in the list of what Apple makes in terms of being a performance powerhouse. So let's go ahead and take a look at the OpenCL score here. You're getting an OpenCL score of 42,896 with those specs right down there. And let's go ahead and take a look at the disk speed. Now, a lot of people who are kind of new to tech uh, or don't really understand what's, what we're looking at here, we're looking at the read and write speed. Uh, so the ability to write things to your hard drive and read things from your hard drive and how fast they really are. Uh, so as you can see here, I was just doing a test and it, it consistently came back at about 2064 uh, megabits per second and 2831 read. Uh, but really it, it's based on what you're going to be using. As you can see there, uh, more towards that ProRes size, uh, you can see the 2160p, uh, which is 4K, uh, is going to have a 528 read and a 719 um, Right, of course, that NTSC and PAL and 720p and 1080 are much, much faster, but they do get less. And really, that's because of the size and how big the data is that you are rendering. Uh, there's no doubt that when you go to 2160p and you are editing 4K videos, just go ahead and take a, a minute clip or a two minute clip or even a 10 minute clip and just see how large that is and what it would take to read and write 
30, 40, 50 gigs worth of data versus a 720p, which only might be a couple gigs. Of course, it supports ThrowRes, 422HQ, Cinema, all, all the different um, encodings and outputs. Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, gaming on this, probably not going to be the greatest. You are going to get pretty decent settings, 60 frames per second on high on most games. A couple games are not going to be really all that well, and they are going to kind of uh, lag. But you are going to get decent performance out of this. Not going to be paying ultra high settings or anything like that. Of course, this isn't a gaming laptop. This sits right between a gaming laptop and a more pro, a more uh, conservative user laptop. So now the question really comes in, who is this for? We've gone over the keyboard, the OLED display uh, on the touch bar, uh, the screen, the trackpad, and the speakers. We, we want to know who this machine is for. Why would you buy this machine, this MacBook Pro, over maybe a regular MacBook or maybe a MacBook Air? Um, why would you get the 15-inch versus the 13-inch? And uh, why would you get this for video editing? So really when it comes down to those questions, you have to start digging a little bit deeper into what are your needs. Uh, the 15 inch versus the 13 inch, well that really comes down to if you're looking at just form factor and size alone, do you want the bigger screen or do you not? If you are taking into factor the specs, the 13 inch MacBook Pro doesn't really offer what the 15 inch does in terms of power and, of, and capability. You also have to look at how often you are traveling. Do you have a smaller bag? Do you have some uh, a lot of stuff in your bag where you can't really carry that 13 inch or that, I'm sorry, that 15 inch versus that 13 inch. It's 13 more of the form factor you're looking for. You're going to get a lighter, uh, slimmer, and thinner design, something that's going to fit in a lot more bags than maybe this would. But again, in terms of performance, on a standard 13 inch, you're only getting 8 gigs of RAM, no dedicated graphics options, and on most, unless you spend the extra $400, you're not getting the touch bar um, or touch ID. Uh, so the next question is, why the 15 inch model explicitly and why is this better for graphics editing than maybe the 13 inch or other Windows laptops? Well, first of all, you're going to have that dedicated VRAM option. It's something that is uh, highly toutable and it's something that you should have if you are doing uh, video editing, uh, content creation, or anything along those lines or any kind of CAD work or anything like that. This is something uh, that is going to use that graphics processing very, very uh, intensively. Uh, as it will the CPU. Uh, you have the option for a quad-core i7 over uh, a dual-core, and you are going to have more video RAM and regular RAM options in there, of course. Uh, when it comes to something you would not probably want to do, why would you wouldn't want to do this, it really comes down to price. Uh, we know Apple makes the best product out there in terms of the MacBook Pro. 15-inch, 13-inch, it doesn't really matter. They make a very premium device. But this is something that costs $2,700, possibly even $3,000 or more. dollars. And it's something you kind of got to look at and go, huh, do I really want that? Or can I get away with a 13-inch? Uh, if you're doing just really light 720p, 1080p video editing, and you're not really doing uh, a lot of resource-intensive uh, machines, or if you absolutely need something uh, that is a little bit lighter or thinner, you can probably get away and save yourself nearly $1,200 by going with, say, the MacBook Throw 13-inch with that 128 gig SSD. So why get a MacBook Pro at all? I mean, there is the MacBook, there is the MacBook Air. Well, yeah, the MacBook Air is kind of different. And the reason I say that is because I think it's going to get refreshed. It's something that is definitely outdated in terms of uh, tech in specs, even by Apple standards, and will probably get refreshed. Then you have the regular MacBook, which literally just offers a keyboard, almost no bezels at all, very, very, very thin, very, very light, very capable for just general web browsing, uh, YouTube viewing, um, Word and Office and iWork stuff kind of like that. Probably not something best suited at all for many games at all, although it can happen because we know that the hardware and software integrates very well with Apple. And it's probably not best for content creation, although it can happen. Um, you're going to have higher render times. The scrubbing through videos is going to be nearly impossible. Um, but it is very light, very portable, something that uh, and maybe an entry-level student would be be perfectly suited for if they went with the Apple and that ecosystem. Oh, why the 15-inch model for graphics and video editing? Pretty simple, right? You're getting that dedicated graphics option. Uh, you're getting a faster CPU. You're getting more RAM. You're getting a better dis uh, display uh, than maybe the other options that are out there. And it's going to be able to scrub through data a lot faster, especially bigger 4K files. You're going to have more screen real estate to work with. And... Uh, encoding, rendering, uh, and exporting is going to be a lot quicker uh, than some of those. 
I've included a picture here of what you're going to get in terms of encoding and rendering times too, just to show you the differences. Uh, although the MacBook Pro doesn't quite come in at the fastest, it is still going to be significantly better than maybe the 13 inch or uh, a regular MacBook or MacBook Air. But why Apple at all? Uh, the might question you might be asking yourself, why wouldn't I just go get a comparable Windows machine? Well, if you are absolutely immersed in Windows and you use everything Windows, Google, stuff like that, well, Google can be used on MacBook too, but if you if you absolutely love the Windows 10 and Cortana and everything like that, it's, it's, some, it's one thing. Um, but if you absolutely are a diehard Apple fan, you have the iPad, you have the iPhone, you have the Apple Watch, you love the ecosystem, you love iCloud, you love AirDrop, you, know, you love iMessage. This is going to work seamless. It's literally just an extension of that Apple ecosystem, and it's going to offer something that's going to give you um, a computer. I mean, we talk about it a lot where the iPhone and the iPad can be computers, but they're not quite computers. They don't have the storage capacity, um, and they don't offer the performance that you're going to get out of this. But you're getting all the same tools. You're getting iMessage, you're getting AirDrop, you're getting Final Cut Pro, which is one of the best editing softwares out there, but it does take a little while to get used to. Let's just be honest. Uh, if you've never used a Mac before, it can take a little while to get used to. Some of the things where you think they are, some of the keyboard shortcuts, the massive trackpad, uh, the force touch. Um, but when it comes to the functionality, the software itself, once you actually get acclimated to it and understand it, it's literally the same. So that ecosystem, having your photos on your iCloud account go right to an Apple account, or Apple machine is perfect. Being able to respond, reply, and use messages on this machine just as you would at your iPhone or tablet or your watch is absolutely seamless. Nothing really comes close to the ecosystem that Apple offers. But there are the downsides. So really the biggest downside is probably the price. I mean you're talking three thousand dollars, twenty five to three thousand dollars for a machine like this and it's not something many people can uh, afford. It's something that a lot of students can't afford, and nobody really wants to have to remortgage their house to be able to buy a computer. Uh, so there are definitely options out there, Windows environment, that are going to offer pretty significant improvement, or uh, pretty significant uh, power. Uh, of course, they're not gonna have the ecosystem or anything like that, but if you can kind of just go over that heap, and not have to have the uh, Mac ecosystem and the Apple ecosystem, uh, then you can probably go with Windows. They're a little bit cheaper. They offer a lot of performance and bang for their buck. And it's, to me, it's almost like an AMD versus Intel. We know AMD has a lot of power, uh, but they're generally cheaper uh, than an Intel option. Uh, and now Intel's really getting, you know, cream of the crop in power. But you look at their prices, you can go, ugh, you know, that's it, kind of hard to swallow. But the old adage, you get what you pay for, really does uh, come true with this machine. You are getting an absolute beast of a machine that can last five to ten years, I think, without a problem. Uh, you're getting instant updates. Um, you're not going to have things crashing and, and doing some of the weird stuff that Windows can do. You're going to have something that's less resource, uh, a, a resource hog, and offer the absolute best performance in that Apple ecosystem is second to none. So really guys, that's all I have for you. This has been the MacBook Pro 15 inch review. Of course, smash that like button, hit that subscribe button, and follow me as we make some of the best tech YouTube videos out there. Again, my goal is to provide you with a very immersive in-depth review so that you don't have to look at 15 videos to get the data you wanted. Thanks guys, and see you later. Peace.